As soon as I saw that connection, I thought, wow, this is, this is real. He really thought he had another life with another family. And he said, when I was here before, I died. When he goes through me and stays with me, I feel like a ghost. My son called me by a nickname only my brother used. Hanny! And he remembered seeing a plane that my brother had only seen. I was really confused and worried about what was going on. When Noah was around four, Noah's dad and I had taken the kids out to eat and we had already ordered our food. We were just sitting there having normal conversation. The kids were drawing on the kids' menu and Noah abruptly stands up on the booth and holds his arms up in a big circle. And he said, when I was here before, I died. And I asked him, when you were where? And he said, here, Mom, here. And I said, on Earth? He said, yes, on Earth. And he took his hand and he said he was in a car driving like this on a road and that his car wrecked, caught on fire, and that he died. This really made the hair on my neck stand up because that's exactly how my brother died five years before Noah was even born. The night my brother passed away, he had gone to the state fair with some of his friends to go to a concert. So at 3.20 a.m. on Sunday, I woke up, just woke up out of a dead sleep. I looked out my window and the car was not there, so I knew he wasn't home and I couldn't go back to sleep. The next morning, the telephone rang. It was Craig and Trini's father, my ex-husband, and he told me that Craig had had this accident and had died. It was just, it was awful. It was a single car crash and that the car had rolled. He had been ejected from the car. The car had burned. I learned later that Trini and I and Craig's father had all woken up at 3.20 a.m. We were in three different locations and we all woke up at the same time because we believe that's the exact time that he died. I know there was definitely drinking going on, and I know there was some sort of discussion at some point. Somebody had tried to take his keys away from him. He got quite belligerent and said, no, I'm going, and would not let them take his keys, and he left. Losing my brother, even though it's been over 20 years ago, still deeply affects me to this day. By the time Noah was around three years old, I didn't really talk about my brother a lot. I'm not sure at that point he even knew that I had a brother. I don't remember anyone talking about Craig's car crash in front of Noah as a young child. When Noah talked about being here before and hearing him recount his own physical death was pretty freaky. We thought we had put the past behind us when my brother passed, but I started to believe more and more that Noah was reincarnated. My son Braden had memories that only his Uncle John could have known. Uncle John was murdered seven years before Braden was even born. At the age of five, Braden started having dreams about what happened the night of the murder. I went and got the box that the police had given us of John's stuff the night he died. I found his clothes. Well, I'll get the shirt. My nose in front of it. It was just all blowed out. Just like explosion. Blasted. I mean, it was just shredded. I got to think, oh, why is it shredded like that? He was shot in the front. And that's when I turned the shirt over. I got to looking for the hole and I found it. 
It was about as big as my pinky. And I had it. Uh, somebody drawed a perfect black mark around it. That's how close the gun was stuck to him. If it had been further back, any at all, that gunpowder would have. Braden said that John was shot in the back. There's no doubt in my mind, Braden knew what he was talking about. He, he was there. And then something else happened. Braden was with his aunt at a farm where this man was working. Braden, as soon as he saw him, he said, I ain't he. I ain't, he, I ain't, he, I ain't he come here. And she thought something's wrong with him. She said, what is it, Brighton? What's wrong? He got behind her and said, you see that man over there? That's the man who shot me. But the man they arrested wasn't the man that Brighton described. Did they arrest the wrong person? That's when we were convinced that the story the authorities told us was not true. We started to wonder if we could get the case reopened. So we decided to give all of the information Braden gave us to the authorities, but we haven't had a response yet. We all want justice for the man that lives in our hearts. Even if we can't get the case reopened, I need to find a way to find peace for my son, but I just hope it ain't too late. My name is Brayden and I'm seven years old. I'm in the second grade. Uncle John died across from a church where the high school is and he died in a yellow house. I sleepwalk like John. I act bad like John. And how I know this is my dreams. John can call through me. I don't feel like him, but when he goes through me and stays in me, I feel like a ghost. I feel like that John came back <clears throat> in Braden to let me know the story of what happened the night of his murder. Our son Aiden spoke a lot about an imaginary friend named Sarah, who he claimed was his sister. He said that he chose me and he came back and that's how he was born. And he looked at me and said, no, I did have another mom in my other house. And that really creeped me out a little bit. And I just look at him and say, what other house? This is the only house you've ever lived in. And he says, no, my other house, the light one with the dark blue shutters. My other room is there, my mom is there, my dad is there, and Sarah's there. And so are my three cats. Aiden would always draw pictures of the other house. And he drew these pictures on more than one occasion. So when he explained all of this, it kind of shocked me. Each time I would ask him the same thing to see if the story would change, it was always consistent. Whenever I would tell Aiden that his other family did not exist, that Sarah didn't exist, he would get very upset with me. And he would look at me with this emotion in his face, like, how could you or how dare you? And Aiden would always say, no, that was my family. Sarah's my sister, and it's all real. I was very confused. It hurt my feelings when Aiden spoke about another family, but it didn't seem to affect him negatively. So I didn't worry. But then one night, everything changed. Aiden was never afraid of the dark before ever. But we were all sleeping in bed, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I just hear this really loud scream. I got up from bed, I ran upstairs to his bedroom, and I ran in there and asked him what's going on. And he was trembling, freaking out, and saying, Sarah scared me, Sarah scared me. I just went straight to his bed. I comforted him and told him everything was okay, that maybe he was having a nightmare. And he said, no, I was not having a nightmare. Sarah put on a mask and she scared me. She's playing tricks. Sarah had, she was putting on scary masks. 
Those like faces, like different faces of Max. She only scared me at night. Before, I didn't see Sarah as a threat. But this night, something just changed. He became afraid of the dark. And he'll call me into his room, even with the lights on. And he'll tell me he's scared. It's completely different from how he used to be. I never took him to a therapist. It never crossed my mind of him having any mental issues. And as a mom, I feel very helpless. I just don't know what to do. After that night, Aiden told me that Sarah liked to play tricks on him all the time. And he refused to go back to his room alone. He kept saying, Sarah is going to scare me. So Aiden pretty much slept in our room for a long period of time. Nothing could have prepared me for what happened next. One day, Aiden and I were driving in the car, and Aiden was in the back seat talking to Sarah. And I asked him, Aiden, what are you and Sarah talking about? And he says, about when I died. That just freaked me out. I had no idea what to say to what he just told me. There's no possible way that Aiden could have overheard about reincarnation because we've never taken our kids to church. I was raised in the Pentecostal religion. We were taught that once you die, you die, and that's it until God comes back and he takes all the souls with him. Reincarnation is very taboo in the Latino culture. I would say especially more so in the religion that I was brought up in. Later when I calmed down a bit and I had some time to think, I wondered if this was what he was talking about with Sarah. Like it wasn't make-believe to him. He really thought he had another life with another family. My daughter Ryland began telling me things that made me look at life and death in a whole new way. She said she'd been in heaven and she'd met my mother. She told me that the rain shocked her and she had died. I was really worried and I wondered what it all meant. She mentioned living in Louisiana and I was very curious to what I could find. I decided to do some research to see if I could find anything connected to what Ryland had said. I searched for Louisiana girl shocked or killed by lightning, and I did find an article. The article that I had found just talked about a little girl who was walking home or near her backyard and that was killed by lightning in the 1940s in Louisiana. When I saw the article, I was like, okay, could, could this be it? Could this be what she was talking about? Was this the little girl that my daughter could have been? I didn't tell her anything about it because I'd always been very careful about the questions I had asked her, kept them very open-ended because I didn't want to put anything there or make her think that I was connecting anything that, that she was saying. I wanted it all to come directly from her. Right before Ryland's sixth birthday, um, I was combing my son's hair, and she walked into the doorway of the bathroom. She said, I remember a plane crash in Louisiana. It didn't match the article that I had found. I thought, well, I'm going to Google plane crash Louisiana. And there was something that popped up, and it was not something I was expecting. There were several articles that popped up about the Pan Am 759 plane crash in Kenner, Louisiana. At the time, it was the second largest plane crash in aviation history. And it was in 1982, and the plane crashed in a thunderstorm. The plane crashed shortly after takeoff from the New Orleans airport and it crashed into a neighborhood. Everyone on board was, was killed, along with eight people on the ground. And 
There was lightning in the area. It was a very bad thunderstorm. I wanted to be very careful about not saying anything to Ryland about it. I tried not to think about it too much. I was just kind of waiting for Ryland to, to tell me more about it. And then a couple days later, she said, 1971. And I said, well, what do you mean? 1971, I know that year, that sounds familiar. She told me the name Jennifer, that Jennifer was familiar to her. That name made a difference to her. And she just walked off. I hadn't mentioned anything to her in the article or anything I'd read on the internet, but as I kept reading through the articles, it did mention a girl by the name of Jennifer, and she was 11 years old, and she was one of the first people that was killed on the ground by the airplane when it crashed. When I read that the little girl was 11 years old, and the accident was July 9th, 1982. I made the instant connection that that little girl had been born in 1971. And that's when I realized that Ryland wasn't the little girl from the lightning strike in the 1940s. Ryland could have been Jennifer. It was just more amazing at that point than anything else. It was like, this is it. To me, we found what she's been going through. There was burning fuel coming out of the plane. That was an instant connection for me. When we would change her clothes, she would say that everything burns. That's where it's coming from. Does she remember a plane coming towards her? What, what does she remember? Three weeks later, we were in the car, and she asked me if I wanted to see a picture of the plane. I will never forget that day. My six-year-old son, Riley, believed he had an old dad who fought in a war and was injured while fighting in that war. I was shocked. I, I didn't know what to believe. I mean, he would tell these details like it was just like reading a book. It was just matter of fact, and that's the way it was. He actually drew a picture of his old dad's house one time showed me where everything was. It was almost like I could have been there with him and I could really visualize what he was talking about because that's how specific he was. Things that he drew and said about his old family is nothing like how we are now. The memories that Riley shared about himself when he was young was that he remembers being small and that his mom would take care of him, but this old dad must have made an impression on him because he was the focus of a lot of Riley's early memories. The person that he described was consistent throughout. After that, he shared that his dad used to fly a plane and that it had guns on it. I have no idea why, but I just said, does your old dad have a name? And he said, Cedric Pocker. I was not expecting him to say a name. We don't know anyone named Cedric. And usually if you see the name spelled, sometimes people pronounce it Cedric, but he said specifically Cedric. And I said, well, where did you hear that name? And he said, well, he told me. Later that night, I put him to bed and I started doing some research on the internet. I typed in Cedric Pocker, and what came up was a Cedric Popkin who shot down a Pocker airplane. And it sounded just like Pocker. My heart just sank. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I found something. A lot of the details of Cedric's life matched what Riley has told me. My name is Riley. I'm six. My old dad's name was Cedric. He flew a plane with guns on it. He came back from the war different. He had two uniforms, dark green and gray. Cedric Popkin was born in Australia in 1890. In 1916, when World War I broke out, Cedric enlisted. He was stationed with the 17th Machine Gun Company based in France, and they happened to wear gray uniforms. It's believed that Cedric Popkin fired the shot that is famous for shooting down the Red Baron. The Red Baron was famous, and this is something that followed Cedric for the rest of his life. About two months after killing the Red Baron, he suffered wounds that resulted in his right leg being amputated. 
After that injury, Cedric returned home. Cedric had two sons. His sons were Roland and Michael that both died over 50 years ago. The interesting thing is that they both died before their father. It was interesting that there were so many similarities between some of the facts that Riley had described. All this time, we thought we had a little kid that was talking about an old dad. Maybe it was his imagination. But as soon as I saw that connection, I thought, wow, this is, this is real. There's validity to what he's saying. It could be a possibility that Riley is one of Cedric Popkin's sons, but I'm not sure. I don't know the answers. I don't have any proof or disproof of any of that stuff because, in my view, you can't have proof of those kinds of things. At least I haven't seen it. I don't know what it would take to convince me. I guess I would know it when I saw it, right? It would have to be something definitive, which I don't expect is coming anytime soon. When I was doing research, I realized that most people who have experienced the past life, they experienced it themselves. Riley's case was a little different because he was really experiencing a past life from his dad's perspective and what his dad went through. For him to hang on to those memories in that relationship, that relationship must have been very powerful. 